Uh, I'm enjoying it tremendously. I'm delighted to be a Martin Marty Center Fellow. Uh, I can't thank you enough for the invitation. So special thanks to Clark Gilpin, uh, who led the center last year uh, and issued the invitation. A special thank you also to Dean um, Rick Rosengarten, who gave me such a warm welcome. And of course, a special thanks to Ryan Coyne and Paul mendes Floor for their leadership of the center uh, this year. And I can't uh, help but mention the graduate students, whom I've never had before, never uh, sat around a seminar table before, only with undergraduates. And I'm just uh, so impressed, so delighted to have um, been exposed to what Ryan Atley said is just this very rich array of, of topics. In other words, you're all over the place, aren't you? Uh, so to, to get on to the topic today, um, first a, a word of warning besides that word of thanks uh, to, to this theologically sophisticated audience, to this philosophically well-informed group uh, to this exquisitely over-educated uh, group, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm not going to be talking about uh, Heideggerians, Derridians, um, Phenomenologists, Derridians, Levinasians, Anatheists, or even Whiteheadians, Deweyans, Rorians, David Sonians. Uh, I'm sorry I won't be talking either today about religious naturalists like Ursula Goodenough, Loyal Rue, uh, Donald Crosby, or Michael Hogue. Uh, instead, I'm going to be doing nothing more ambitious than a slice of intellectual history, something, something new for me. Um, which has its place in what I sometimes think of as a firmament, an academic firmament that resembles Disneyland. <laughs> I know that a number of you are uh, riding those bright, blazing spaceships in Tomorrowland. Some of you, I sense, have been veering towards Fantasyland. So I'm walking down Main Street, USA, uh, with, with this project this year, called Believing Scientist in America, Trials and Tribulations of Theistic Evolution. I hope you won't think it too pedestrian. Ben Carson, retired pediatric neurosurgeon and failed presidential <laughs> candidate, declared in 2011 that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution was encouraged by the adversary, Satan, the devil. Well, one of the things I'm hoping to do over the next few years, one of the books coming up on my docket, Carson continued, is called The Organ of the Species. Not the origin of species, but the organ of species. And we're going to talk about the organs of the body and how they completely refute evolution and several other things as well. Just a year earlier, Dr. Carson had been elected into the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine, considered one of the most prestigious honors in medicine. For many years, he had been the director of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital, a professor of oncology and pediatrics. In 2004, he served on the President's Council on Bioethics. And in 2008, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, Dr. Carson's curious capacity to combine impressive scientific credentials, surgical precision, anti-evolutionism and Seventh-day Adventist piety represented an extreme case, but one that could glide right into place along a continuum of positions taken by the leading scientists over the last 150 years. 
in America's long debate about Darwinism, multiple camps have come and gone in the public square, the school boards, the courts, and the academic literature. Some have declared the compatibility of evolution with religion, usually in this country, the Christian faith. Others have denounced the very attempt to show compatibility. Like evolution itself, as the population of believing scientists has diffused, it has also diverged. The earliest, most constant, and at first glance most rational position is theistic evolution, to which I will return uh, shortly in this brief intellectual history. Throughout the first 150 years of Darwin's reception in America, religious authors fell all over themselves using labels to denote to distinctions that set their views apart from others and cast them in a superior light. The differences, however, between theistic evolutionism and creationism, fundamentalism, intelligent design, or new earth geology, are more important at the biological level of discussion than theologically. All accepted the premise that God guides or guided, creates or created natural history and human history in some unspecified way. Theistic evolutionists drink from the same doctrinal well as creationists as far as this premise is concerned. William Dembski, a leading intelligent design theorist, whose hostility to theistic evolution was the most evidence of Freud's narcissism of small differences, defined it this way, quote, as far as divine design, as far as design theorists are concerned, theistic evolution is American evangelicalism's ill-conceived accommodation to Darwinism. What theistic evolution does, according to Dembski, is take the Darwinian picture of the biological world and baptize it, identifying this picture with the way God created life. When boiled down to its scientific content, theistic evolution, says Dembski, is no different from atheistic evolution. The trials from Dayton to Dover. Two trials of revolution stand out in American religious history and provide reverse mirrors to each other. First, the Dayton, Tennessee Scopes trial at the end of the first quarter of the 20th century. And second, the Dover, Pennsylvania trial, Kitzmiller versus the Dover School Board District at the beginning of the 21st century. H.L. Mencken described the Dayton trial as an expose of, quote, the menace that fundamentalism offers to civilization. At the Dover trial, 80 years later, the intelligent design movement was described as just creationism in a cheap tuxedo. <laughs> Neither trial was directly about theistic evolution, but each exhibited the passions and the moral anxiety that made theistic evolution with its embrace, with, with its definite embrace of evolutionary theory, seem comparatively reasonable, a way of eating your creative cake and having it evolve too. <laughs> the Dayton trial in 1925 was more about religion than science. Yes, um, Spencer Tracy was awesome. Uh, yes, uh, Clarence Darrow turned William Jennings Bryan's laudable faith into laughable credulity. But more deeply, Dayton epitomized the way in which debates that seemed to be about evolution were rooted in social and political anxieties over the education of youth, over race relations, and over a shift in cultural authority from a clerical elite to a scientific elite. The story, the story of the Scopes trial, uh, which I'm not going to go into in detail, has been brilliantly told in Edward Larson's Pulitzer Prize winning study, Summer for the Gods, the Scopes trial, and America's continuing debate over science and religion. 
Clarence Darrow may have succeeded in humiliating poor Brian, who died five days later, but he did not persuade the court that Scopes case was about intellectual freedom. John Scopes, as you know, was found guilty of flouting the Tennessee law against teaching evolution in the public schools, and it was later overturned on technicality. Um, so, so far, you know all of that. Um, what do you know, what do we know about John Scopes? Um, um, what textbook did he use? This might be a teachable moment. Uh, so I brought with me Ravenstein's copy. Another reason why I'm so delighted to be here this year <laughs> is the use of that wonderful library. This is the textbook that uh, John Scopes used to teach evolution. If you've never thought to look it up, uh, it's called Acidic Biology. And it was written by George William Hunter. And on the front page, in pencil, a student, we suppose, or perhaps a faculty member long ago wrote, textbook Scopes used. 1923 printing. So this is it. And uh, it is a, a research paper waiting to be written by somebody for what it reveals uh, about eugenics. And that was one reason why William Jennings Bryan was so easily enlisted in the Dayton trial and wanted to ban evolution because it had become associated, uh, it offended his religious sensibilities insofar as it had become associated with social Darwinism uh, and that associated with a commitment to eugenics. But I, I'm beginning to digress and I didn't mean to do this. Uh, it's a research paper for someone else to conduct. <laughs> um, um, looking at the very um, um, matter of fact way in which George William Hunter warns of the perils of a low and degenerate race, uh, which is described as parasites spreading disease, immorality, and crime to all parts of this country. Were they lower animals? Uh, he said, we would probably kill them off to prevent them from spreading. Maybe society didn't yet um, permit the killing of inferiors, but it did have certain remedies to protect itself, such as confining them to asylums. Well, you get the picture. Um, for the next three decades, creationists mounted no legal challenges to the teaching of evolution. They didn't need to. Darwin and evolution have been all but eliminated from biology textbooks after the Scopes trial. Let's fast forward to 1958. Top scientists then started writing papers warning 100 years without Darwin are enough. 100 years without Darwin are enough. Uh, why? Oh, another teaching moment. What was happening culturally in 1958 in America? Yes, it was the centenary of origin of species. Uh, uh, on the origin of species. Yeah, but it was all it was funny. It was a renewed emphasis within uh, America on science and science education in order to keep up with uh, the Russians. And it was also in that year, not until that year, that uh, NSA enlisted top scientists to start rewriting the biology textbooks uh, that, that had been allowed to um, all the language as they were for a 30-year period. Fast forward again. Only in the 1970s did the oxymoronic sounding creation science or scientific creationism, those phrases, uh, come into vogue. 
thanks chiefly to young earth hydraulic engineer Henry M. Morris, who published The Genesis Flood in 1961 with John C. Whitcomb, an Old Testament scholar, followed by a textbook in 1974 called Scientific Creationism. Because Morris rarely referred to scientific and philosophical authorities, uh, and because, according to that wonderful historian Ron Numbers, of, uh, I hope you all know his uh, monumental history called The Creationist, from Scientific Creationism to Intelligent Design. <coughs> according to him, Morris, quote, for the most part, worked outside the context of established science and philosophy. And therefore, his preferences to scientists who shared his form of anti-evolutionism, quote, served largely as literary ornaments. By the mid-1990s, scientific creationism had morphed into a new species called intelligent design. Based at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington, uh, ID advocates eschewed geological arguments of the young age of the Earth. They issued the details of uh, Noah's flood. There were no claims, as uh, some of my previous students did, that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Uh, and they focused on that argument from design that I didn't make that up. Finding biological evidence of a godlike designer would seem to be a philosophical or religious pursuit. But biochemist Michael J. B. at Lehigh University claimed to have discovered a result so unambiguous and so significant that it must be ranked as one of the greatest achievements in the history of science, he himself said. <laughs> This was, as he explained in Darwin's Black Box, the Biochemical Challenge to Evolution, 1996, the bacterial flagellum, an irreducibly complex organic structure that propels microscopic organisms. The impossibility of its having evolved from simpler forms was the linchpin of his argument and his cagey conclusion in favor of an intelligent designer. Uh, the conclusion was couched in consistently non-biblical, non-religious rhetoric, which, however, failed to conceal well we know whom. Uh, when Behe appeared at Dartmouth College in September 2005, he was as close to being a rock star as he would get, uh, drawing a large crowd of undergraduate student supporters and a smaller but brave turnout of graduate students in biology. Thank God for graduate students <laughs> uh, who insisted or who, who intended to challenge his uh, science. But the star sank soon after when he gave what can only be called an inexpert testimony for the defense at the Dover trial that same fall of 2005. When questioned on the stand, he admitted that intelligent design theory lacked a mechanism for explaining how design structures arose and have not been supported by a single paper in a peer-reviewed re scientific journal. When asked whether his very expansive definition of a scientific theory uh, that included ID, would also include astrology, the blundered into answering yes. <laughs> and for good measure, he swept in the ether theory of the propagation of light as a, another example. Verging at times on a Monty, uh, Mon Monty Python skit, the total testimony the prosecution elicited from Michael D. and from members of the Dover, Pennsylvania School Board, who started this whole business, exposed the Christian creationist doctrine inside the Trojan horse of intelligent design. The high profile setback suffered by the ACLU 80 years earlier at Dayton was reversed by the high profile rebuke 
to ID at Dover. William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow had their theatrics at the Scopes trial, but the evisceration of Michael B. at the hands of the prosecutor, Eric Rothschild in Dover, did in ID forever. Just as Larson's Summer for the Gods told the story of the Dayton uh, Scopes trial in fresh and surprising ways in 1997, and seemed to sum up then America's ongoing angst over science and religion. The best thing written about the Dover trial was Judge John E. Jones's, Jones III's own 139-page decision that ruled in favor of the plaintiff. Uh, the, the lead plaintiff, by the way, was Tammy Kitzmeyer. Miller, Kitz Miller. Uh, and this is what gives you renewed faith in America to discover. Uh, she was a high school graduate who worked as an office manager uh, at a landscaping company. She had two daughters, uh, one in high school, one about to enter high school. She wanted them to learn science and not superstition. So in a beautifully written opinion that deserves to be studied for its elegance, Judge Jones excoriated the Dover School Board for what he called breathtaking inanity. He ruled that, quote, while ID arguments may be true, a proposition on which the court takes no position, ID is not science, end quote. He then made three devastating arguments. First, ID invokes supernatural explanations, unlike science. Second, it relies on the mistaken reasoning that evidence against the current theory of evolution supports the ID inference of design. Third, scientists have refuted the negative attacks on evolution lodged by ID theorists, according to the judge. Jones emphasized that ID had not been accepted by the scientific community, had not had Papers published in peer review publications have not been subjected to testing and research, all points that have been conceded by Michael Lee under cross examination. The reason that Dover was a decisive turning point in a way that Dayton had not been can be credited to the way in which Judge Jones invited and heard plenty of science in his court. Dayton's trial had very little discussion of biology, but much discussion of the Bible uh, in a delicious irony that I will soon exploit. The person who uh, did the most to explain the unscientific basis of ID was Kenneth Miller, a biology professor at Brown, uh, a Catholic, and author of the book Finding Darwin's God, a scientist Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution, 1999. Which brings us to part two, the tribulations of theistic evolution. As illustrated in four case histories of how believing scientists in America wrestled with the teachings of the Christian religion uh, and with Darwin, these four I have in mind as most, I don't know what I'm asking another time, what, what, what's my criterion for selection is. Uh, but Asa Gray, Francis Collins, Joan Ruffgarden, and Kenneth Miller. Um, each of these had um, a nemesis, um, which I don't have time to go into now, um, and, and shouldn't, shouldn't mention. In fact, I only have time to go into two of these. Uh, Asa Gray and, um, and Ken Miller, uh, those four I will mention here today. But most, the first, the first prominent theistic evolutionist in America was Asa Gray, professor of natural history at Harvard and the leading champion of Darwin's origin of species in America. If Thomas Huxley was Darwin's bulldog in Britain, Gray was Darwin's lapdog in America, tirelessly defending the compatibility of natural selection and natural theology, 
and maintaining a friendship and regular correspondence with Darwin. Most illuminating are the letters that touch on religious matters, chiefly the reception of natural selection and the problem of design. And for anybody who doesn't know it, you can read all this now online, thanks to that marvelous uh, site, The Darwin Project, which has put uh, the, the Cambridge is publishing the volumes, and they're now up to what, 24 or something like that, but you can also um, read them on, online. Uh, there are fascinating decades long correspondence under um, Isa Gray's, um, notably uh, published as Darwinian uh, papers that were at the time of uh, uh, in, the, in the 19th century. Uh, it stands today as the early, ev earliest evidence of the times of trials and tribulations in store for those who would try to mold Darwinism into a form deemed compatible with Christian beliefs. Gray, unlike his colleague, um, Louis Agassiz, that's one of the nemesis stories, uh, the other key player in the reception of Darwin in America, welcomed natural selection as the primary mechanism in the production of most species, but he favored a special origination in connection with the appearance of humans. How could natural selection, quote, account for the formation of organs, the making of eyes, et cetera? Those of you who remember William David, the eyes keep coming back. Uh, not randomness, but divine providence acted here, he proposed, to affect such inexplicable variations. Politely but firmly, Darwin rejected Gray's suggestion. In a letter in 1860, he wrote to Gray that he doubted whether every action of every animal, even a specific swallow eating a particular gnat at a particular moment, could reasonably fall into God's pattern of design. And if these minute actions are not designed, then why should one believe the origins of man or other species are designed? Gray continued to maintain that natural selection was compatible with Christian belief in a creator God since, quote, the physical cause of variation is utterly unknown and mysterious. And, quote, he, he could even detect a theological advantage to using Darwin's theory to account for the imperfections and failures as well as the successes of nature. It permitted a more convincing theodicy. The apparent waste is part and parcel of the great economical process that serves God's ultimate purposes, a God who left the details to chance was somehow noble. The problem of suffering could be mitigated rather than magnified by Darwin's theory, Gray thought. Pain and suffering could be seen as necessary concomitants of a struggle for existence that was itself a precondition for the emergence of more complex beings like ourselves. It was the price to be paid for a truly created universe. Darwin thought that this theodicy was most improbable. In another letter, he delicately, Darwin was always so, um, so delicate, so polite, so gentle, so humble, so, in the end, so agnostic, uh, responded to Gray's idea of design variation by saying that the real source of his objection was not that design variation would make natural selection superfluous, but rather that Darwin's own studies of domestic variations had shown him what an enormous field of undesigned variability there was for natural selection to appropriate for any purpose uh, useful to a particular creature. Species are mutable, continuously evolving entities whose explanation is non-teleological. The world does indeed seem designed, as Darwin always pointed out, but that is due entirely to the workings of natural selection. Moreover, the biblical creator God, unlike the distant God of 18th century deism, 
could be expected to be less indifferent to the ongoing needs of creatures, the variations on which the process of natural selection depended had to be spontaneous rather than designed. Uh, this much Darwin science had carefully established, and there was, for him, a grandeur in this view of life. Accepting organic evolution in general, Gray nevertheless made an exception for humans. Shot down by Charles Darwin's gentle corrections and humble petals, Gray could accept everything about evolution except the hard part. No purpose, an unpredictable future, a past that has gone from chemicals into life and from fish brains into human consciousness. The idea that no intelligence, foresight, ultimate purpose, or morality is involved in natural selection was deeply unsettling to Asa Gray as it would be for later theistic evolutionists like Francis Collins, author of The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. Joan Rothgarden, author of Evolution and Christian Faith, Reflections of an Evolutionary Biologist, and Kenneth Miller, whom I mentioned. All prominent scientists, all expressing the view that faith can be consistent with evolution. There were culturally important voices in America at a time when public interest and media attention were more apt than at any other time to make public intellectuals out of them. They framed what was to become a vigorous debate in America, and for a while, standing up to the new atheists, they stood as shining exceptions to the view voiced by the Cornell scientist William Provine an expert on the history of this is too long a sentence. Uh, an expert on the history of evolution and genetics, uh, who by the way got his doctorate at the University of Chicago in 1970. According to Provan, quote, belief in modern evolution makes atheists of people. One can have a religious view that is compatible with evolution only if the religious view is indistinguishable from atheism. These believing scientists seem to confirm instead the retort that Stephen Jay Gould gave in evaluating a survey of some of the prominent evolutionary biologists of the 20th century. Quote, either half my colleagues are enormously stupid or else the science of Darwinism is fully compatible with conventional religious beliefs. And, in that confusing way that we would have, and he said, equally compatible with atheism. <laughs> I, I think he was trying to say there is no particular preference uh, or, or religious direction or non-direction built, built into uh, Darwinism. Looked at closely, the arguments used by believing scientists were hard to distinguish from sheer assertion or special plea. Two years after the end of the Dover trial, uh, uh, two books appeared. I'm only going to talk about them uh, briefly. Francis Collins, and the other one, of course, was Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, ironically appearing, well, maybe not so ironically, appearing in the same year with uh, Francis Collins' uh, confessional account about the language uh, of, of God. Collins, uh, as you know, helped to discover the genetic misspellings that cause cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, and a rare form of premature, premature aging. He was a pioneer gene hunter. He led the Human Genome Project from 1993 until 2008, and for his revolutionary contributions uh, to genetic research, he was awarded the Presidential Medal uh, in 2007, and the National Medal of Science in 2009. Um, he still serves as director of the National Institutes of Health. In his 2007 
seven bestseller, The Language of God, in a section on theistic evolutionism, Francis Collins wrote, quote, God, who is not limited in space nor time, created the universe and established natural laws that govern it. Seeking to populate this otherwise sterile universe with living creatures, God chose the elegant mechanics of evolution to create microbes, plants, and animals of all sorts. Most remarkably, God intentionally chose the same mechanism to give rise to special creatures who would have intelligence, a knowledge of right and wrong, free will, and a desire to seek fellowship with him. He did not tell us how he knew all this, <laughs> or why he thought that morality could not have evolved or arisen via secular and cultural human processes, but must have been installed in our brains by God. The most serious problem of Collins' theistic evolution was the lack of any theory about how something that is not material or energetic can cause anything. If the creator hypothesis was meant to account for why there is nothing, why there, why there is something that evolves uh, rather than nothing, then it is an origins theory. An origins theory is um, whether naturalistic or theistic have always suffered from an infinite regress, whether of matter or of spirit, play it either way. Naturalism had a better explanation in standard causal terms, and theistic evolution, to judge from Francis Collins' book, had none. Kenneth Miller did better. Both his 1999 book, Finding Darwin's God, and then his testimony at the Dover trial showed in clear and convincing detail how complex cellular mechanisms do not require a design to explain them. They can be explained by evolution with the concept of co-optation. Starting from nothing, it can seem all but impossible to explain how a complex system can be created by a random process. But we don't start from nothing, as Miller explained. Complex systems are built of less complex building blocks that originally existed for a different purpose and then were co-opted, making the task less daunting. Wanting to make a case for the compatibility of science and religion, Miller was too good a biologist to think he could make it, um, make his case on the basis of evolutionary biology without producing a deus ex machina or a deluded theism uh, or something dull, which has been done many times, rather than the active uh, and involved God of biblical theology. So, abandoning biology, he turned in his argument at a crucial point uh, to physics, specifically to quantum phenomena, and argued that the indeterminate nature of quantum events allows a clever and subtle God to influence events in ways that are profound, even if scientifically undetectable to us. Fast forward through the text and the footnoting, there were at least three problems with this proposal. First, quantum states in the aggregate are regular and predictable. So it was hard to see how God's manipulation could help shape of any events at the macro level, which is what we are usually talking about or care about. Second, uh, the defining nature of quantum events is that they are simply not determined, not by God and not by any other hidden variable. And third, Miller's proposal violated the conservation law by adding God to the equation and thereby changing the equation in a way that made quantum events dependent upon antecedent energy expenditures. As a wholly contingent and absolutely non-teleological process, evolution defied the efforts of even the most nimble of Christian theologians like John Hoff 
of Georgetown University. Now, for the first time, I'm departing from the leading scientists, practicing scientists, to consider a very related case, um, uh, John Hopp, whose many books engaging science and religious issues appeared alongside those by Francis Collins, Joan Rothgard, and Ken Miller, Carl Giberson. There is a story there, which I haven't gotten to the bottom of, but I'm trying. And during the same period uh, as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, um, Richard Dawkins, Dan Bennett, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris. Not, however, could no more accomplish what the believing scientists were unable to do than Darwin and his successors could refuse all linear teleology. Could stop, I'm sorry, could stop refusing all linear teleology. Therefore, Hobbes' ongoing efforts to reconcile theology and evolution, culminating in his 2015, you'll notice I've thrown all this into the past tense in order to make it seem over, <laughs> or at least like intellectual history, but it's pretty recent. Uh, it, it is a 2015 publication. It is magisterial, and its title is Resting on the Future. Catholic theology for an unfinished universe. All these efforts uh, were dead in the water, motivated by a desire to find some form of linear teleology, sometimes modified in a Teilhardian fashion, other times drawing, that's another chapter by the way, uh, other times drawing on Whitehead's metaphor of God as a lure for theater. Teleology was precisely what Darwin dropped from evolution, dropped altogether from science. Depictions of a god up ahead, or what Huck called a transcendent force of attraction, may have creatively relocated God, but at the cost of either misunderstanding or undermining the theory of the physical process of evolution and natural selection. But that was not all. Something else was misunderstood in these debates, too, insofar as God guiding the evolutionary process was thought to add energy or make things happen that would not otherwise have happened without God acting. The scientific principle of the conservation of matter energy is a powerful constraint on any account of the biblical notion that God acts in history. 20th century biblical theology struggled mightily to make sense of that notion, but it rarely considered the problem in terms of the stringencies of the law of conservation of energy, according to which energy in a closed system uh, can change form but be neither created nor destroyed. 20th century theology had two choices, either go existentialist as Rudolf Boltmann did in the 1940s, or face up to the fact that the assertion that God acts in the physical universe, not just in human self-understanding, is a spectacular violation of a known law of nature, which takes us back to David Hume's devastating argument about miracles. In the end, the theistic evolutionist offered us no stable, intermediate position. No stable, intermediate position. Anyone who accepted Darwinian evolution at all had to shrug off any vestige of an Aristotelian or Abrahamic vision of God as prime mover or creator. The traditional worldview was turned upside down impossible to understand mind, meaning, and purpose as anything other than late evolutionary effects of a cumulative ratcheting up, as Dan Bennett calls it, from mindless, motiveless mechanisms, not as their cause. Design could only be understood as generated originally by bottom-up processes. All of the top-down processes that characterize human life are themselves the fruits of these bottom-up processes at many levels and, and many scales. 
including Darwinian processes within individual brains. All the theological attempts at compromise at having both God and natural selection turned out to be ways either of papering over this very same picture with religious poetry that failed to introduce any additional factual or explanatory material, or purporting to give an ultimate explanation by introducing what Dan Dennett again called a skybook, that is, an imaginary device that springs the frame of mechanical explanation as opposed to a crane, which is a complex intermediary mechanism that arises from the process of evolution itself and in turn speeds the process along by promoting the process of development in a still more complex way. In Dennett's terms, God was a skybook. Sex is a crane. <laughs> a second call it the first tribulation. A second tribulation with believing scientists was their overt admission of superhuman causal agency <clears throat> alongside or over and above the process of evolution itself. As when Francis Collins wrote that the Big Bang cried out for a divine explanation, or Jim Roughgarden announced that Jesus was resurrected and appeared to his disciples. The problem with this was that once you admit the supernatural into your explanation, anything goes. Already in 1838, in one of his early notebooks, Darwin could conclude that attributing the structure of animals to the will of the deity was, he said, no explanation. It has not the character of a physical law and is therefore utterly useless. Religious explanations prove useless to science because they give no direction for research, suggest no testable hypothesis, give no reason to expect one result rather than another from experiment or observation. At just this point, of course, it was open to a Collins or a Roughgarden uh, and many theistic evolutionists have taken the option to make a strategic shift that long ago found favor among theologians, that is, repairing to the level of symbolic meaning and interpreting the content of Christian faith as a message about the vicissitudes of human existence symbolically coded. Richard Dawkins offered a good satirical parallel that showed what happens when theologians repair to the symbolic level. Suppose, he said, that one day in the fullness of time, science discovers that the DNA double helix is false, that we got it all wrong, and DNA is not a double helix. Now, any scientist would say, right, pity about that, but we'll work on finding out what it really is. Dawkins' take on liberal theology, theistic evolutionism, the work of the authors I've cited and others, was that it would say instead, ah, but in some other sense, the DNA double helix surely has some meaning for us. What is the DNA double helix trying to tell us in the world today? Maybe the twisting of the two strands of DNA has some significance for the uniting of human beings one with another. We must set aside the purely mundane issue of, is it true, which is crude and passive. <laughs> we're not talking about truth in any simple sense. <laughs> uh, we want to find an underlying symbolic sense. End quote. Uh, for Dawkins, uh, there never was an underlying symbolic truth. Either it was true or it was not. The third uh, and single most important tribulation for those who would know natural selection of the God hypothesis was the way in which it leads to the vexing problem of evil. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection should be troubling to 
theist of any sort, not only to biblical literalists or theistic evolutionists. What sort of God would create living things through random change mutations in a fierce struggle for existence? Darwin himself toyed with a kind of theistic evolutionism early on, but he came to acknowledge that deep uh, abyss between the many imperfections, cruelties, and waste of nature and the idea of a caring and personal God, even one not conceived of as omnipotent and perfectly benevolent. The fossil record, as many scientists point out, is one of 99% failure. Superfluity, wastefulness of finite resources, mindless experimentation, hardly induces any inference to a God hypothesis. Uh, in one of his novels, Peter DeVries has a grieving father say, what baffles me is the comfort people find in the idea that someone dealt this mess. Blind and meaningless chance seems to be much more congenial, at least less horrible. Prove to me that there is a God, and I will really begin to despair. To sum up, theistic evolution is what survived the trials in America from Dayton to Dover. And as a religious history, as a religious position, it has a history of tribulations. Um, I cannot close without um, emphasizing that last tribulation, the one that theistic evolutionists have never faced up to convincingly that ancient problem of innocent suffering and evil that we can blame. And who of us, wherever we may locate ourselves on the scientific or on the religious spectrum, has anything worthwhile uh, to say here? Uh, in, in my part of New England, I would like to quote Robert Frost a lot. He generally gets the last word, uh, so I'll give it to him uh, here in the poem that you have uh, called Design. It is written as a Petrarchan style song. Not only is it the genre most traditionally associated with love, but it's also a quite small poem and one that, along with haiku, is probably the most rigidly controlled poetic form. Each line can have only 10 syllables with five strong beats. There must be 14 lines, no more and no less. And the lines must rhyme in a very specific pattern that includes an octave of eight lines and a sestet of six. It must repeatedly reuse the A and B rhymes. Design thus governs in a thing as small as a sonnet. Malign and dark design is what attracts three creatures to the same spot at the same instant in Frost's poem. The heel all, a flower that is normally blue, in this case is white and growing by the side of the road that Frost is apparently walking down. Sitting on top of the flower is a dimpled spider, fat and white. In its web, the spider has entrapped a third mutant, a white moth, which Frost describes the spider holding like a white piece of rigid satin cloth with dead wings carried like a paper kite. These assorted characters of death and blight have been brought together in a little tableau of murder and horror that prompts Frost's great questions. What had that flower to do with being white? The wayside blue and innocent heel all. What got the kindred spider to that height then steered the white moth thither in the night? What the darkness design of darkness to appeal.
so much. We have um, about 25 minutes for questions. Floor is open. Thank you, thank you, Nancy. That was that was wonderful. Um, and I'm just curious. I've been curious about this for a while. Um, how your work on believing and the sciences in American history relates to your work on in analytical philosophy and in, in epistemology and pragmatism. Is there a linkage for you? Is it like one led to the other? Or is it just no, I'm, two talking, very I'm not things? talking about you, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not wearing my other hat today. Well, I think this was the kind of, um, of evolving breadth of multiplicity of interest that one acquires teaching undergraduates and other moments. It's, it's a separate research project altogether. As was that, I hope that I had so much fun editing, not writing, but well, there's a great deal of writing in it that I did, but editing, uh, The Faith of Scientists, I think you heard a version of it. Um, totally unrelated to gender studies, <laughs> the feminist theology, totally unrelated to Davidsonian semantics. Philosophy of religion. But of interest, you know? Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I was absolutely fascinated as you went through this history and wondered, since I, since I know you weren't speaking to us because you said it, um, first off, the book is on believing theists. Nazis. So it, it, it's a very, it, 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 the book well, addresses scientists. Really the scientists, but we talked about, you talked about theists, yeah. not theists. Um, that's not a criticism I'm trying to, oh. I'm trying to tease out. So that's the first part. Okay. What is the relation between them? That, that would be the first small, <laughs> small thing. Second one is you started with course, and it's just shocks me, uh, but it shocks everything. Um, and I can imagine a reader reading your book and saying to themselves, wow, the repetition of an error that, as you pointed out, three times reflects anxiety, social, psychological combinations of them, of a culture in evolution, the United States culture. But this is not a diagnostic of, of cultural anxiety that you're doing. That's so your project. That's, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I am talking about it. Um, so if it's not if it's not a sociology of, of anxieties, and since you don't tell us about why you're doing this, the question is, firstly, for whom are you writing this, and why would you suppose that a Carson or someone with less, you know, cultivation of Carson would trust your authorship, not you, but your authorship? In this domain, so it's the two questions: he is and he is, and the, the whole question of how your authorship enters into this discussion as a historian and a professor. Oh, I, I, as a historian, this discussion of uh, this discussion of the history of believing scientists, mm -hmm. or to put it really simply, who's reading you, and who are you hoping to at least enliven? the great problems in these movies? Oh, that's a tough question. A good one. I should think more about that. Um, I, I think my interest was uh, in part related to the Martin Marty mission. Um, there is nothing that is more center stage in, in the public marketplace in America than science and religion discussions. Uh, representatives of the Chicago and High Park group can attest to that, though I think we all hate the um, monolithic use of science and religion debates. Um, but it's certainly culturally important. Um, for that reason alone, it has to do with my interest. But you're right, I'm not a sociologist nor a psychologist 
talking about the deep undercurrents of anxiety that Darwinism aroused in America, but that would be somebody else's research project. How do you put together uh, Darwinism, the Gilded Age, progressivism, the scopes, content, the whole political context and eugenics uh, going on in, uh, in the, uh, the first quarter of the Congress century? Um, I think that that's a, another story that deserves to be told. And I don't know who's going to read mine. I have to write it first. But any ideas, any ideas you can give me, please. I guess I have a question about agnosticism and atheism. Um, because the, early on in your talk, you talked about Darwin's agnosticism. And yet, and you talked um, about the project as being about believing scientists and the anxiety believing scientists. But ultimately, and you said you weren't talking to us, but I guess I found myself more and more talked to <laughs> as the talk <laughs> progressed because as when I you started talking about. I delivered myself of a series of opinions. <laughs> well, when you got closer to the Dawkins position, and you start talking about the law of conservation of energy, I found myself thinking that those who are actually under attack in this view are not believing scientists, but those who refuse actually to have a conviction either way, because in fact, the um, when you start talking about causality, there's a sense that anyone who abstracts themselves from that question is actually under a state of delusion. And I guess I was interested in the fact that you phrased the project in terms of believing scientists, but ultimately it actually seems any form of agnosticism is actually the ultimate target. You're right. You're right. Okay, there's a couple of very good questions there. You know, one of the believing scientists, why should we believe them? And what, and what do we do um, in, you didn't say this, but I'm thinking yet, in the cases, which I didn't talk about either, where scientists are having themselves great debates in the so-called uh, Darwinian synthesis, the, the modern synthesis of uh, Mendelian genetics and um, the Dawkins work on the genome side of these sort of kind of bonds and natural selection. Big debates there. Uh, am I pushing it towards a certain kind of conclusion that forsakes agnosticism um, uh, and veers uh, into atheism. Uh, that suggestion I might recoil, though I might have to admit that I'm doing some of that. Uh, another related question refers to Darwin. And I think there's no scientist with whom it's more important uh, to distinguish phases of his life than Charles Darwin. Uh, it was only at the very end that he became the gentle agnostic I've depicted him as. And he certainly did start out, as most of his generation did, as you know, with uh, William Paley and the argument from design and the Church of England, etc. So again, it was a slow process of, um, of moving to, and he was probably a better agnostic than I am. I aspire to that kind of agnosticism. And have you left any room for it? Well, that's just it. That's what I'm, I'm finding. Um, don't you have to say, as, as I did, there is no middle ground. There is no place to occupy. I mean, unless you call it agnosticism and you say, well, uh, there's just no way out of having to say either or. But you can't put the two billiard balls on the same spot. Natural selection, Darwinism, the whole theory, the whole fact of human history, and the creator God, the hypothesis. Biblical theology. Now, the more interesting question I'm waiting for it from somebody here is really what about the crown of the human theology? What about the, the postmodern developments? What about those who have you know, forsaken long ago? And, either as agnostics or as atheists say the God hypothesis of classical theism, of traditional biblical theology is, you know, that's, that's passé, that's gone, that's, uh, as most of our contemporaries uh, have done. I just what heard, about them? I heard them attack too, insofar as any form of symbolic. Oh, 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 yes, that, you know, that's not a chapter in this book, but it, it is, yeah. and I have, and I have written on it, but I, with you. Uh, it's an easily misunderstood criticism. 
whenever you say to a theological audience, symbolic meaning, there's no such thing. There's a, semantically, there's just meaning. You get looked at as though you know, you're some kind of a geek with a you know, slide rule, a deaf to poetry, insensitive to opera, and, and a literalist. A literalist. So I wish we could get rid of the language uh, that distinguishes naive and sophisticated and talk instead maybe about a realist reading of scriptures um, versus an allegorical one. I don't mean any of that when I say uh, this is a semantic product to understand what something called symbolic meaning might be. Symbols abound. That's obvious. We have loads of symbols and images to be have. Something different called symbolic meaning. What is it and how do we know what it is? And why use it? Why use it? Unless you are already presupposing a referential theory of meaning and a divine object, whether grounded being or something else. Anyway. Um, but it's sort of uh, it's conspicuous, and I, mean, I think you're talking about it really um, uh, sort of originally conspicuous. I mean that um, uh, you know the sort of stable intermediate, uh, you know some some um, uh, decent proposals for a stable intermediate position um, have been um, you know uh, have have really overtaken and become um, you know the, the status quo in academic. Theological and, and philosophical, uh, well, particularly theological cir- circles, like for like the last 200 years, like since Kant, at least uh, I, I would say, steadily growing, and have not, it seems, taken any foothold in, uh, you know, amongst um, scientists or the lay public. And so, do you have a sense of of why? I mean, Dawkins' satire aside, which I, I think his carry is really not fair, um, but do you have a sense of why that? Why that disconnect? That, um, uh, I have a yes, I have a sense, and that's a long, long galactic mile from where we started here today mm-hmm. of of how that history goes in theology and philosophy. Are you asking why have not the sciences uh, adopted an appreciation for symbolic well, Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would, I would, I, you know, I, I think. To, 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 to say that all of liberal theology depends on symbolic language is, is um, that doesn't seem quite right. But basically, you know, liberal Why theology. When did that, that shift occur? When did that occur in the modern period? And why? And what other movements were afoot? Romanticism. The higher criticism. All of those new texts that were being discovered in 19th century Germany, let's just pin it down to that. Uh, there were other people's texts. There were some you know, other cultures. They occasioned no real crisis of faith. Well, there were some, but, but less of a crisis of faith about the meaning of one's own Christian or Jewish scriptures in the West, these are not myths. Myths were other people's works, translations, which had to be deciphered. Um, it was a slow go throughout the 19th century to come to see um, our own preferred text as mythical as well. Rather than give them up, nobody Intended to do that, and rather than say they're false in the way that fiction is, is false, I think there was widespread attempt to avoid that, uh, that kind of admission in favor of saying they need something else. They point to, they participate in, to use politics language. Um, another kind of meaning, even better, different. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a long, long story. And I 
I hope to tell it uh, in a more convincing way than I ever seem to be able to do on my feet. And I don't know of anybody who's told it um, in a thorough way. So, yeah, can I ask yeah. so, so, so my, my question, that, you know, uh, more aligned with this intellectual history that, that you're doing is, um, um, for whatever reason, that which you're describing has 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 pretty well taken hold gradually in among theologians. But why? I mean, the avoidance. I, I would think that this, what you just called sort of the avoidance, you know, avoiding the problem, that would be very appealing to scientists. And as you've told the story, they don't. The, the most of um, the most believing scientists have not taken that. They've chosen to violate conservation of energy rather than avoid the problem in the way that theologians have. The one I'm discussing, the ones I have to. Yeah, discuss. yeah. Well, and I think I mean it seems just in, um, anecdotally, it seems to me that that's generally um, that that most non-theologians have, really have no idea about this avoidance strategy that's, that's on the table. That's it, 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 it may be something that is not yet in the 21st century for the most. It would be a hard thing to do for people whose professional uh, vocational identity is all wrapped up with interpreting certain scriptures, with teaching certain um, increasingly creative uh, theological perspectives. Yes. Um, so I'm a scientist who heard about this and snuck in. And I'm also a believing scientist in that sense. Um, so I guess what I wanted to ask is that I, I liked very much most of the talk and followed you very well. And then you offered a few scientific critiques, especially to Miller. And I found those, frankly, to be fairly dubious and also from my viewpoint as a scientist, you didn't offer any of the evidence that I would need to actually be able to back those claims up. What science um, are you most interested in? Physics. Physics. Um, yeah, and my work is quantum mechanics every day, so I think about it a little bit. But, I mean, as examples, I would be happy to discuss at length about to what extent making a choice of a quantum state one way or another could have macroscopic effects on the world. And, and it's a fascinating question. And there's no obvious way to claim that that can't have a large effect. Another example is that when you're talking about energy conservation, you're presupposing that the universe is a closed system. And if the universe is an open system that God interacts with, then by definition, you are not violating that law. And that is even presupposing that God has to obey laws like this. So at least could you say something about where these scientific critiques come from and how you're able to sort of make those because they're very authoritative in the way that you presented them? Well, and I'm, I'm happy to be instructed on the literature. Um, from what I have read, I, I would dispute your word large, large effect on the macro. Um, but that's something I'd, I'd love to talk with you about and get some sources. I have um, no real sources to offer you. You're the physicist. Uh, but I will say this. I think it's very interesting that this move occurs among a number of theistic evolutionists. Who, whose own field is biology. And the move is to seek some reconciliation with their faith at the level of physics. Whether it's cosmological, um, you know, that's fascinating stuff that's being done there, uh, or the quantum level. So I think there's something about physics in there that, um, that it's speculative and, and um, rather breathtaking scope that lends itself more easily to alignment with religious visions of one kind or another than the biological level. And again, there are great debates in biology and how we are to, to understand the 
the, the unit of selection. Um, and I don't mean to, to minimize those, but I'm struck by the, the, um, the good alliance between theological and metaphysical speculation and the current realm of physics and string theory and the vacuum fluctuation background. There's a wonderful book, a brilliant book by a new one by um, uh, Mary Jane Rubenstein, Worlds Without End. And again, she's an agnostic. I think in a, maybe a more consistent way than I managed to be. She just gives you the history of the parallel discussions, Nicholas to the Cusa and others um, through, that have an, almost an exact parallel in schools of uh, physics today. The multiverse theory, which, as you know, is receiving a real comeback, um, seems to be based on hard science. Yeah, anyway, it's there, I mean, we, we, we can spiral into that, but, but there's somebody from the side of religious studies, she's chair of the Department of Wesleyan, who is working this comparative uh, road historically and, and brilliantly. And what's her choice of a science? Not biology, but physics. Physics is where you find the most um, uh, inspiration for a new metaphysics and a, a new religious vision. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say as one really quick point, I think one of the reasons physics comes into it so strongly <laughs> at these points is that it's much easier to at least imagine that we can make definitive statements about the universe and about what is possible and impossible at the level of physics. Whereas biology is so complex, no matter how you look at it, that it's hard to lay down any of these rules mm -hmm. that say this is how it works or this is how it works. And you're dealing with organic material. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm inclined to press some of the same kinds of questions that have come up about who it is you're talking to and you need to persuade and uh, and whether or not there's a, a, a middle ground you're, you're permitting and, and whether um, uh, uh, you maybe give short shrift to some of the theological alternatives. Um, and the way I'm inclined to press the question is to say that it kind of sounded to me like you uh, took the cases you considered to sort of demonstrate the fundamental irreconcilability of any religious or theological position or claim with any properly scientific claim. And it seems to me that setting the bar pretty high is especially well with any with any properly scientific or any Darwinian account. And well, I think it's setting well, the bar pretty high on both sides. Selection. Well, I think it's setting the bar pretty high on both sides because of first of all the huge range of theological options. I, I think to character to dismiss all of the alternatives to fundamentalism with um, the, under the, the heading of just symbolic meaning is, is maybe to miss some of the alternatives. Um, and I take it as well that a lot of debates in philosophy of science about, for example, whether it's really true that teleology has no role to play. I take it there are debates about whether all of the sciences are reducible to physics um, uh, and whether to the extent that they aren't, it's because, well, but, it, but it's, it's the question of whether biology isn't reducible to physics, I think partly involves the question of whether it's right that a teleological level of description can be eliminated from it. Whatever it is, but what I, what I wonder is, given how high it would be setting the bar to claim to be showing that there cannot be any position that reconciles these, I wonder if, and I don't have a suggestion to make, but I, I wonder if there's another way to put or characterize the interesting question I think you have about um, the socio-cultural moments at which these uh, kinds of anxieties find certain kinds of expression. Because mm -hmm. that seems like the interesting stuff you've identified. It, but it doesn't seem very promising to me to. It doesn't seem promising. It doesn't seem promising to me, to, me to think that what's significant about these is that it shows the fundamental incompatibility of, uh, I think, 
I think you can get at the, the interesting thought you have without burdening yourself with the need to entitle yourself to such expansive claims on both the theological side and the scientific side. Okay, I'll take that. I'll think about it. You know, this is but one slice. Um, if I were to go on to enumerate living options of, of a sort that isn't theistic evolution, um, that's where I get uh, stuck, uh, where I find it more difficult. Where I guess I want to say, well, okay, Tillich, Grant Bean, Paul, um, um, Mark Johnson's book, Saving God, you know, Rails Against the Magic. This is all just anthropomorphic idolatry uh, in his terms. It's a beautiful book. Um, how did I deal with that? Well, that's, that's a further chapter. Um, and, I, and I think certainly for a complete picture, the various schools need to be considered and denominated. Now, I think it's too simple to reduce them to two, but my friend Wesley Wildman, at the BU, some of you know him, um, has used the language that I kind of you know, like that there are the entitated being gods and then there are the grounded being gods. And I'd probably try to find a little bit more, not so few. But those are the models, let's say. Those are the conceptual models. Um, and even process thought by getting metaphysics can be placed, I think, under the entitated being things where the being is in question is the totality, the whole, uh, considered as as a unit. Uh, the kind of being is um, theologically so vague, so nebulous, it comes down to deep I guess, and uh, I should appreciate it, it's power to, to evade precisely the kind of criticisms that I can rightly be launched in the spirit of so, yeah, I'd say Grand Dean is also a little Hello, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I, I am, I, I think that one thing that I think you might want to keep in mind, again, because this is a moment, uh, is the, the uh, basic scientific uh, assumptions that uh, are, are, I guess you would say very materialistic that all there is is, is energy and matter when in fact uh, with the I, I am seeing the, uh, the interactive part of things as being some, in many different sciences being seen as more basic than, than the, uh, the working material you might say as for example, with the with the identification of the Higgs boson, we we now uh, it seems quite clear that energy was here before matter was here. Uh, that it matter only emerged because of certain interactions. And as uh, if you if you take the work that's being done at the Santa Fe Institute, for example, on emergence, uh, again you're talking about interactions leading to different kinds of organization of matter and as you reach each different level, uh, many of the rules uh, actually change at each at each level. And so it I, I'm not sure if you can work with this or not. I've been trying to myself of, of changing on, from ontology of simply matter and energy to an ontology of interaction being more basic. It's almost like putting a verb being more basic than a noun. English and German are very noun-oriented languages. Not all languages are. Um, it, and, and this... Interrelatedness? It, yeah. Entangled. Yeah. Relating to higher emergence. Yeah. I think it's very interesting that uh, Stuart Kaufman Yes, kind of yes. Started out as a biologist, right? But but you're seeing this now. He's talking about the sacred. 
I know. I know he is. Dartmouth class of 1960. Well, there are two. Terry Deacon is another person. Certainly, this whole idea of self-organizing yes. uh, has added, I think, a richness to post darwinian interpretations. Of Very much so. And, and that, uh, if it is self-organization, then it isn't just, you know, the fittest fighting against the other one to see who's fitter, but rather uh, interaction leading in a creative um, manner that we might not have seen the end of yet. In fact, I would probably have. It, it, possibly. Yeah. Possibly creative. Yeah. Possibly. Possibly not. And probably some of each. No doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation following a fascinating paper. I would invite all of you to, to stay around and to continue the conversation. We have some great uh, refreshments in the back, but uh, first, we have uh, another word of thanks to our presenter. Thank you.